Guru Purnima is an auspicious day where we pay our humble respects to all of the great gurus who have came before us and the ones living today. Now, sadly, the idea of the guru has become neglected in the modern day because people think it's an old idea. But we still have living gurus today and we've had all of those gurus who have come before us. And I know that on a day like today on Guru Purnima, we should pay our respects to all of those great gurus. But every day we should pay our respects to all of the great gurus that have come before us, particularly if we come from the Eastern spiritual traditions. It's very important to pay our respects because they are the ones who kept the knowledge alive so that we could benefit from it today. Now, the idea of guru has become trivialized in English, obviously, where we see we have a business guru, we have a management guru, but that is not really what the word guru is. And this has been a problem with a lot of Sanskrit words going over into English, such as karma. So we have this word guru that's been kind of trivialized, right? But the word guru actually means the dispeller of illusion or the one who breaks the spell of the material bondage we have in the world. So the guru helps us overcome this bondage we have in the external world and this idea of duality. So guru means the dispeller of that ignorance. Now, sadly, in the West, the idea of guru it feels uncomfortable for a lot of people, particularly in the West, but I would say also outside of Asia, people have a sort of negative idea of guru, or they just think it's an older idea. But as I said, particularly in the West, a lot of people have a negative reaction when they hear the word guru, and they have a sense of skepticism. Now, this is a little bit to do more so with Western culture because Western culture is individualistic. And because Western culture is individualistic, sometimes there can be a bit of a know-it-all mentality can develop in the West. Whereas in the East, it's much more of a collectivist mentality where it's more of a holistic culture where we depend on the traditions over and above our own egocentric beliefs and our egocentric interests and needs. We are part of something much greater. And that's one of the big points in the East is that you have this kind of unity based on the traditions of that culture. Now, today we're speaking about Guru Purnima, which is mainly celebrated in India. So people have a connection to Sanatana Dharma, Hinduism. And that's being kept alive and it's the longest enduring culture on the planet even though it is constantly being attacked by external forces. Nevertheless, this idea of guru in the West, a lot of people have a negative reaction to it and a lot of people will make fun of particular gurus because look, let's be frank, there are some gurus out there, not just living but also before our time, who have used it for their own benefits, for their own self-interest and for making money, for influence, etc. But when you go to India, actually a lot of the gurus, I would say over 90% are actually genuine and you'll find gurus actually in smaller communities where the community is connected to the guru. Just because you see one guru on TV doesn't mean that's how all gurus are. That may be a popular guru and that doesn't mean that that's how the tradition ordinarily is. It's usually much more private and much more communal as opposed to worldly exposure. And so the sad thing is in the West, we are slowly seeing the death of the expert. Because of the rise of technology, a lot of people think that they know a lot more than they actually do. And we, we're seeing all around the world the death of the expert, where a lot of people will not consider an expert's opinion, even though they have decades of experience in that particular field. And being a guru is no different. And it's kind of ironic that we see a lot of people who might just read one text and think they know a lot of things and think that they can speak down to the guru or think they know more than the guru themselves. And I encounter this on the channel myself. I'm not a guru, but I encounter it on the channel because I've studied under many teachers and all I'm doing is delivering the actual Eastern knowledge, but then other people will have a different opinion of it not based on the actual traditional knowledge, but based on their own subjective opinion that's been warped in some sense by a Western view 
of Eastern spirituality, maybe from Western teachers, so to speak. But it's important to learn directly from the source, to go to the actual source scriptures and sometimes to learn directly from a teacher. And that's what the guru-disciple relationship is all about. It's about passing down that knowledge that goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, all the way back probably to even further than the Indus Valley civilization. We don't really know, but we have this lineage of knowledge that's passed down from generation to generation. And so it's a living lineage. It really is a living lineage. And if you are blessed to have come across the Eastern spiritual teachings, then you are part of that living lineage that we are all in this together, moving towards individual liberation and collective peace step by step. And we've been doing this incrementally for thousands of years. And that's what this guru-disciple relationship is all about. And as I said earlier, there are different ideas of what the guru is, right? Because it's been trivialized in English. And so we have all of these different type of gurus, right? We've got sporting gurus, boxing gurus, etc. But in India, it's really important that because when we use the word guru, so for example, if we look at Indian classical music, traditional music of India, the beautiful traditional music of India, the teacher themselves is a guru. This is the difference between Western classical music because in India, Going back thousands of years, I don't know so much about today, but in the traditional way a Indian musical master guru would learn, they would learn the Vedas and Upanishads in tandem with the music that they were mastering. So it was required to understand Vedanta as a musical guru because the actual tradition and all of the knowledge of the Upanishads is embedded within the music of India. And so that's why it's important. But in saying that, the ideal guru is the one who has direct knowledge of Brahman. Brahman here being the ultimate reality of existence. The substratum of everything we can conceive of. The ultimate consciousness, the supreme consciousness that you and I are, that connects us as one. And so the ideal guru is the one who has the direct knowledge of Brahman. And this is how the tradition began, from the gurus who had a direct knowing of Brahman. And this goes back to the rishis, the ones who actually delivered the Vedas, the ones who revealed the Vedas through themselves. And going through the tradition, then we have the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutras, the Mahabharata, which includes the Bhagavad Gita. And you also have the Ramayana as well. So you have all of these great texts that have come down from the Vedas, based on the Vedas, on the great knowledge of the Rishis. And this is what the Guru is passing down, the one who has the direct knowledge of Brahman. Now, there's not many people who have that direct knowledge of Brahman, obviously, throughout time. That's why we can probably count all of the great enlightened masters on two hands. But the point is, is that we all benefit from this knowledge. And when we look at this guru-disciple lineage, it's very important as we realize in Upanishads to stay close to a guru, to learn directly from them. And there's a few reasons for this, because obviously you're sitting close to a master who is enlightened, but also a guru has an exemplary character. They don't have to act moral. Their exemplary character is naturally moralistic. They care for all. They have infinite compassion and forgiveness for others. And so when you sit beside a master for a long period of time, then it has an effect on yourself, and then you bring that out into the world. Now, when we look at the traditional guru-disciple relationship, it obviously began in very small settings. Like in Sanskrit, we have the word gurukula. Now, gurukula means living near the master in their dwelling and being educated in Sanatana Dharma, but specifically educated in Vedanta. When we talk about Vedanta, we're talking about the Prashjana Trahi. Now, the Prashjana Trahi consists of three texts, the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutras, and the Bhagavad Gita. Now, obviously, as you know from my previous videos, as you go further in your training, you will learn the Nididhyasana texts, 
Stavarkar Gita, uh, Avaduta Gita, the Mandukya Upanishad Karika, these sorts of texts. And so that's what a guru kula is. You stay near the master and you learn directly from them. And that benefits all. And in the traditional setting, you actually had to remain with the guru for 12 years, if you can believe this. Not in all schools, but generally there was this idea of a 12-year period where you would go through training with a guru. And that's when you would be tested at the end of the 12 years to see if you were actually ready to actually deliver the knowledge yourself and to continue that living lineage. Not all would finish that, obviously, but there would be a very small minority that would finish that and, and then take the knowledge out and deliver it to others. And the reason why this happens is because the guru is not no ordinary person. They're no ordinary person. They've gone through their own training. And to become a guru, as I said, when you do have an exemplary character, you actually have to go through a process of purifying the mind. A lot of people get this wrong, particularly Westerners who study Eastern spirituality, where they think that, oh, I just know this knowledge. Now I'm enlightened. And it's like, well, yes and no. It's as Ken Wilber said, you can still be a spiritual a-hole after enlightenment, so to speak. And now I'm not saying that any of these Westerners who claim this are enlightened, but they miss the point where you have to go through a sense of purification to understand the deeper aspects of Vedanta especially. And that's why the guru is a kind of healer in some sense, because they clean our eyes of the illusion of Maya, of measuring the reality into this and that, which is what Maya is. It's the measurement of reality according to our own conditioning, according to the socialization process that we've gone through. And then what the guru does is they apply the non-dual medicine of Brahman into our mind. And this is encapsulated with a beautiful verse within the Guru Stotram, which states, Salutations to that glorious Guru, who, when I was blinded by ignorance, applied medicine and opened my eyes. So in the Guru Stotram, it's even saying that the Guru applies medicine and opens their eyes. Now, this medicine is obviously the knowledge of Brahman. That's the medicine we're talking about. Medicine here is referring to the wisdom of the ultimate. That is the ultimate medicine anyone can have. No medicine in the world can compare to that knowledge. And that's the importance of being with the guru. So in conclusion, guru is not an old idea. And we shouldn't have a negative reaction to it. Because part of the spiritual path is humility and deference. Now, as I mentioned earlier with the death of the expert, a lot of people have a problem deferring to someone who has more knowledge or is more skillful at something. And this is becoming a big problem in the world, not just in the West, because we're becoming so individualistic and we don't want to think that other people have more knowledge than us. And what I've seen also in the West is a lot of people have a problem deferring to even their elders these days. And so a guru's got no chance if that's the case. I remember growing up when there was a big emphasis on respecting your elders, even if they were in the wrong sometimes. It's part of paying respects to those who have come before us. Sure, there is a limit to that, but we often don't get to that limit. Usually in ordinary life, we can just pay respects to our elders or to anyone in general, and we can defer if we have the humility to do so. And this is a problem with people disrespecting the guru-disciple relationship and a guru themselves because people have a problem with deference. And part and parcel of the Eastern spiritual traditions is humility and deference. You need to have the humility to defer to the one who has the knowledge. And if you are not willing to do that, then you will never have the knowledge because that humility is a priority in understanding the deeper knowledge. You need to lower yourself to have deference to a guru to understand that deep knowledge. That's why we bow. That's why we prostrate before all of the great masters. It destroys our ego because we're giving ourselves over to that individual who has the knowledge. 
And we are saying, look, we don't have the knowledge, but we desperately need it because from birth we have suffered. Sure, we've had momentary moments of joy, but they never last. The suffering comes back. And it's based on our own conditioning, our own socialization process, which builds this illusion of this identity. And the guru is there for us. If we have the humility and the deference to pay ultimate respect to them and to learn from them sincerely. So in conclusion, I'd just like to pay pranams to all of the great gurus living and who have attained Mahasamadhi before us. And let's hope that we can all have the humility and deference to continue this lineage far, far into the future. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.